church, there's going to be one phrase of this scripture that, will, oh yeah, I know that one. And so to, to kind of set the scene, I know there, there have probably been times in your life where you have taken that, that, that breath, right? And, and just like that breath carries something, but to know more of your story makes sense of why that breath is so deep. So I'm going to give you the, like the back story. This is the pre-sermon. The real sermon's only going to be about four minutes, so you just give, you give me a pre-sermon here. So first of all, what's going on before this story? Northern Israel, Northern Israel was dealing with a petulant narcissist ruler who, first of all, used just random cruelty in order to get support, get people excited. And two, talked about religion, but really made a mockery of religious values at the time. And three, worked to burrow in so much power that other people thought, the government is not even going to work anymore if this leader gets to do what this leader wants to do. Any resemblance to persons living or indicted is pur purely coincidental. <laughs> so second of all, the people in, the, in northern Israel, a long time ago, the people who wanted to resist, people who wanted to resist that, that leader, they were worn out. They were exhausted. They had been resisting. They were resisting when they had strength and they were young. They were resisting when they had wisdom and they were middle-aged and they're resisting now, but they're, they're tired. The king wasn't even that bad, but the queen had her pulse on the scales of greed and injustice, and she kept pressing harder and harder. So Elijah is the prophet in this time and place, which means he's the leading voice of the resistance in his time and place. Good man, genuinely called by God, but Elijah, like so many, was tired and worn out and confused about what is next to do. And again, I'm, if this sounds familiar to any of your lives, I'm, I'm sorry. This is just a Bible story. If you start thinking it might be relevant for your real life, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Uh, so just let this be just a story about Elijah, not about you. Okay, so there's a showdown. This is the third step, the showdown between Elijah and the supporters of Queen Jezebel. You've heard the word Jezebel. This is where it comes from, Jezebel. Her supporters are called the priests of Baal. Baal is this other god. So the story here is, is kind of absurd, but basically it's a barbecue contest. I, I'm serious. If you grew up in the South, it's a barbecue contest. Um, Jezebel's priests in the barbecue contest, their whole power tends to come from intimidation and misinformation, and that doesn't light a fire under a barbecue. So their strength, what they think is their strength, is ultimately very weak. And in that place, Elijah, this is great in the Bible. If you're reading this in your King James or something, you're totally missing the point. Elijah is trash-talking these, these priests. Uh, they, they keep trying to light their fire, and they keep praying to God, God, by all God, would you come down and light this fire? So Elijah says, and I quote from my own in translation, You'll have to shout louder to Baal, for surely he's, he's, he's a god. Uh, perhaps he might be away daydreaming right now, maybe. Um, or he might be on the toilet. Uh, it says that in the Bible. If your Bible doesn't say that, your Bible's lying to you. And then, and then Elijah goes on and says, is he on a trip? Is he asleep? Do you need to wake him up? And all those Israeli nationalists, all they knew how to do is get more angry and get more violent amongst themselves, which doesn't accomplish anything. It never has. It never will. Amen? So in the face of these this like overwhelming but ultimately incompetent opponents, Elijah, when it's his turn in the barbecue contest, he gets organized. And you, you, you got to hear that. In the face of a broken system, when he's tired, he gets organized. Church, what do we have to do to stand up to injustice? Get organized, okay? So Elijah, very, this is where you're going to read in your Bible, and it gets very boring. It sounds like a spreadsheet. He's doing these 12 bricks over here and four bricks over here. No, he carefully makes an altar. It's an expression of organization. It sounds so boring, but it's a mathematical way of saying something poetic. And then God starts the fire, which is a religious way of saying something inspirational, and then together they cook this, this cow, which is a dramatic way of saying something hopeful. And Elijah wins. Hallelujah. End of the story, right? No. Because afterwards, Elijah does exactly, he doesn't really treat the priests very well. Chapter 19, verse 2, Jezebel, she says to him, 
may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. That's my best Jezebel voice. I don't know how to do any more. Um, and now Jane is going to pick up, um, not because of the Jezebel voice, Jane's going to pick up because Elijah is running. Or Elijah is, he's, he's had a lifetime of, of success. He's just won the most important battle of his life in a metaphorical and literal way. And now he's scared of this woman. So he's fulfilled his mission. Uh, he's finished the task. He did it well. But he has no clue what comes next. And that's terrifying. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in southern Israel, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. Okay, I would invite any of the kids who want to come up to the rainbow to come on up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna get right in the middle so I can see an Ashley over there. I can see a Trip over there. Henry's hiding in the corner over there, so can't see Henry. But. Uh, Okay, so Eli was scared, and so he ran. Sometimes when I'm scared, I run. There's that weird little part where he's scared and he pushes his friend away. Sometimes that happens when we're scared. We push people away. When he was scared, he went and hid in a cave. Well, now he's lonely and afraid, and that's a bad combination. Now, luckily, God shows up there and says, uh, take a nap. Do you like naps? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Old people, do you like naps? Okay, okay. You, wow. That was, that was the best amen we've had in here in two years. Yeah. Okay, let's try this. Ashley, do you like cake? No, no. It's, it's your brother who doesn't like chocolate. That's, that's the strange one. Church, do we like cake? We love cake. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cake is good. So God said when he's scared and when he feels alone and when he's pushed his friends away, God says, take a nap and eat some cake. And sometimes, okay, sometimes a nap and cake will do it for me, but then God says, take another nap and eat some more cake. God is good, amen? Amen. Yeah. Okay, so after his cake, after his nap, Eli felt less scared. But so many of us are like this. We think that God is always huge. So even though he's less scared, he starts, where are you at, God? Where are you at, God? And he expects the big bell. We th- I thought the big bell was going to call us back. It wasn't. It was one of your little bells over there, right? It called us back. <laughs> Sometimes we expect God to be big and powerful. But in this story, God is a whisper. Just like, I think, a teddy bear is better when it's soft. Cupcakes are better when they're fluffy. Sometimes it's up to us to hear God's whisper in our life. Well, let's pray all together. And Hilltop, the way we do this for the children's sermon is I say some words and then everyone gets to repeat them. So we're all together. Dear God, Dear God speak, to us speak to us with a gentle whisper. A gentle whisper. We, will we will listen very carefully. Very carefully. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. There Elijah came to a cave where he spent the night. The Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was only the still, small voice. I wish I could tell you that Elijah had it all figured out right then when the still small voice came in. Uh, I wish in my life every time that I have that full breakdown and land on the ground and, and God is there, I wish that was kind of the resolution of the story and I, I understood. But if Jane kept reading right after the still small voice, you can check this out at home or in your Bible you brought here. God asks again, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah answers the exact same words, word for word. Says, I have zealously served the Lord, but everything's their fault. You meet people who get stuck in that rut? I'm doing my job, it's all their fault. Uh, and I'm alone and I'm scared. I'm still alone, I'm still scared. You have answered and answered and answered, but I'm still alone and I'm still scared. It's almost like Elijah is just stuck. Even though he has all this experience, all this wisdom, all this resources, all this spiritual support, he cannot get out of his rut. The way I'm framing this story, it may be new to some of you, this is not a story for young folks. The story we're reading today, the how we're reading it today, this is for older folks. Uh, it's for people in a midlife crisis. It's for elders who cannot believe that we are still dealing with the same issues now that you dealt with when you were young. It is for seniors who are desperate to leave a legacy of peace onto the world, but they don't know how to affect that. So God says to Elijah, okay, you're stuck in a rut. It's time for your next calling. And Elijah is so fresh out of his own ideas He's so, he's so worn out, he's so, he's so empty of anything he can come up with, he decides to follow God's plan. He follows God's plan right to the next stage of his life, which in this case, what he does after what, what Jane reads is he hands over leadership. Uh, remember, all these 40 stories are like a hinge point in our life. It could be a graduation, it could be a marriage, it could be a divorce, it could be a retirement. Here, Elijah is called after his career-defining project, after 40 days of contemplation, after listening through all the chaos, after hearing the still small voice, after still feeling confused and unfulfilled, his job is to encourage others and to find hope in the shadows where he thinks it's just darkness. You ever feel unfulfilled and confused and without direction? You ever wish you saw optimism so full of bad news in the world. We, couldn't we just have some good news to keep me going today? Do you ever feel stuck? Like everything you try, it doesn't really make a difference. You put more effort in and, and you're still in the same rut. At some point, you decide it's time to follow God's ideas rather than your ideas. 
Unfortunately, the storytelling of this, this that keeps going, the storytelling and the poetry really break down after this, but Elijah does go find, who does he find? Anyone, anyone from, from, from Sunday school? Elisha, that sounds almost the same. So Elijah gets Elisha, I don't know if it, how well is it doing that. Yeah, it did it really well. This thing is getting better and better, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he goes and anoints this young guy to be the next prophet, and he starts to train him to be the next prophet, just like Kenneth is back there learning how to do the soundboard so you all can hear me. It's good stuff. So there's some resolution there, but, but for some of us, there are these hinge points in our lives. S someone in here might be in such a mirrored place that Elijah is with, with your life. You feel this inbreaking of opportunity. It might be to lend power. It might be to teach the next generation. You might be called to mentor or to put down your privilege. Some of us might be in just such an obvious way of this story, but others of us, this story might just be highlighting our exhaustion. It might be highlighting how this way of life that we live and that the culture lives is just not working anymore. And you are invited to a place of rest and reconsideration. You might be called out of fighting and finding ways to handle uh, that better and let others have the front lines. You might be called out of loneliness and to stop pushing those friends away, but to, but to bring someone else along on the journey. You might be called out of chaos and toward whatever still small voice will speak to you. Elijah took 40 days and 40 nights to think about his life. Can you, can you imagine, what would it be like to just take 40 days out of your life right now to just think about what's next? How could you carve that out? Wouldn't that be something? Uh, he thought about what had happened. He thought about who he was. He thought about where he was going. And after all that time, we hear one of the most evocative phrases in all of literature. Jane read it perfectly, calling us to listen to the peace that glides under the noise of so much life. Now, I don't know what that gentle whisper will say to you, but I am certain that it will be in the language of peace. I don't know how you will respond, but I pray that you will do it by standing up in trust. I don't know what God has in store for you or for us, but I trust that you do have a path to follow, and that path will bring you deeper joy that soaks into your spirit. May it be so.
From the quiet center to the crazy Sunday morning after worship, we need your help. Um, if you're big and strong, we need your help to move some chairs. On Easter, there's always a lot of people in here, and afterwards there's a few fewer people. So we need to take 30 of these chairs and move them over into uh, the youth room and stack them up, push them in there. And then we take the rest of these chairs and stack them up in that corner because tomorrow uh, someone's coming in here to clean all the carpets and do all that good stuff. So if you're strong, you can move the, move the chairs in there. Marcy may have other chairs to move, just f you know, follow whatever she wants. Um, two, uh, Janae has a pile of other church cleanup things. So if you're not big and strong, Janae's gonna put you to work doing something else, I'll bet. Okay, so follow Marcy for chairs, big and strong. Janae for uh, uh, valiant um, and not as strong. Um, three, when all that is done when all the chairs are in the corner so that people can clean the carpets it's time to wrap burritos we do this every month for our friends uh, who are teenagers who are on the edge of homelessness so we're gonna do that in the gym four on the way to all of that stuff I know it's a lot right I only have <laughs> only have five fingers so I can't go very far on your way to chairs and burritos um, stop it there's the table back there to RSVP for the anniversary celebration some of you have uh, given, which is great, and, and some of you, technologies, God, phones break. So just go over there and let them help you. If you haven't RSVP'd for the dinner uh, May 5th or the festival on the 6th, then we know who's all coming to that. If you want to help out that week, there's a lot of chairs that are going to need to move in there. There's some children to be watched, all that good stuff. Um, Five, uh, oh gosh, I do have six fingers. Five, uh, on the way to all that mess, there's also cake and good things like that because we're celebrating something in a second here. We're going to celebrate baby Alora. Six, Presbyterian women. I'm not talking about next week's spring brunch that my brilliant wife will be speaking at. No, no, no. And Presbyterian women. No, I'm not talking about the wonderful book that you're going to start reading this week that is so popular that we're going to have to have another book club with men involved so that everyone can talk, but first women get to talk on their own. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the garage sale You've already made one sale, right, Karen? It, it, it works. The stove works. I, I bought something, so we got one sale. But the garage sale is a big deal. If you want to help out with that, uh, meet with them after everything else. Is that everything? Okay. You might, like, be annoyed by sermons here, but you're never going to be bored because we're always going to have something, and we're going to have something to get quiet. So if, if this family of faith has ever helped you to, uh, to have an active faith or to find the still small voice, you're always welcome to give a donation in the basket back there or online.